Hello everybody, you're listening to The Archer on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dan Cobain. This is the weekly radio show where we chat about the local arts news. We have a different guest on each week. We head over to the Rye Light Zone for a short story and or some poetry. We play local unsigned and or independent music and we catch up with Twanglin' Jack Ford over in the Oak Shed for a weekly album review. As always, you can find us on Facebook. If you search for The Archer on Wickham Sound, you should be able to find us. We're repeating on Wickham Sound on Monday nights. We're on the Wickham Sound Listen Again, iTunes, Spotify and wherever else you get your podcasts. Please do leave us a review on your podcast platform form of choice it all helps out and you can reach out to me at the studio on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk that's d-a-n-e dot c-o-b-a-i-n at wickhamsound.org.uk I particularly want to hear from, I am particularly keen to hear from poets performers musicians anybody with mp3s to share local arts news etc don't hesitate to get in touch so this week we're going to be chatting to science fiction author Isaac Savage but before we do that we are going to head over to the Rye Light Zone now and we're going to have the latest part in Twanglin' Jack Ford's series My Musical Journey. This is part number five. Myself and my friends Phil, Rick and Denny were persuaded to move our recording setup from my parents' house in the suburbs to a basement below a video shop in West Hampstead. This came about after Phil and Rick had been spotted playing in a wine bar by a man named Spiros, who owned the video shop opposite. Videos of all sorts can be purchased. The finest, lovely, lovely videos. Some of the sweetest videos I ever made. Uh, now this ain't going to work out. We're going to have to try something else. I've got another idea. Plug in video! 335 West End Lane! The complete lane! Brilliant! We had also been helped out by my friend Tony, who had been the bass player in my first band. When we found ourselves in the much more credible postcode of North West 6, Tony brought his friend Wurzel from Motorhead along to do a guitar solo on one of Phil's songs, for which Denny, Rick and I had performed the backing track, with Tony playing bass and programming the drum machine. Try to sort it out Can't you hear it calling? There's never any doubt Catch me now on the was trying to get interest in some children's stories Phil had written, set in Japan, so we did some music for that. I also found myself recording a song with a Bond girl. Spiros knew the production company that made the TV show Max Headroom, that was very popular at the time. Max Headroom was played by an actor called Matt Frewer. I recorded some songs for a children's project that he was working on. Having done him a favour, we hoped he would perform a rap for us. We recorded a backing track ready for it.
This was such a good idea that the Art of Noise also thought of doing it. And he went with them and had a hit. Spiros and the producers of Max Headroom were working on an animatronic rock show they were hoping to put on at the Trocadero in Piccadilly Circus. We produced a jingle for the event. One, two, three o'clock, four o'clock, rock. Five, six, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, rock. Nine, ten, eleven o'clock, twelve o'clock, rock. We're gonna rock around the tracks tonight to get the glad rag down. Join me, hum. We'll have some fun till the clock rock wrong. We're gonna rock around the tracks tonight. We're gonna rock, rock, rock to the bottom line. Gonna rock, gonna rock, gonna rock around the track of Dero. I attended the presentation, but the singing model of Elton John was less than convincing, and another outfit got the gig. Then the same team acquired the rights to Doctor Who with the intention of making a film starring Rutger Hauer. They asked us to come up with some ideas for theme and incidental music. One of our ideas was to add Gary Glitter drums to the original theme. This was an idea that later worked well for the KLF under the name of the Time Lords. About this time, Phil and I recorded an incredibly romantic song, which for some strange reason we played to someone we knew at Bronze Records, Motorhead's label. <laughs> Lost in a crowd Not understanding The way that I'm feeling Wiping a tear from my eye When you said goodbye Her advice was similar to a suggestion Spiros made, so it must have been a good idea. It was custom romantic songs for people to buy off us for special occasions. We called it Sculptures in Sound. Someone made us a logo, a single red rose. Such a good image that the Labour Party also came up with it. We had a stall in Harvey Nichols. Radio 2 did a piece about us for the Through the Night show. They interviewed Spiros as the world's fastest record producer and they played a jingle which we had quickly knocked out. We did one of these sculptures in sound for a London socialite who asked us to provide original music for a fashion show. Spiros's next idea was a play with a female version of Max Headroom. He called her Mini Catastrophe. Oh, don't you just love it? One of us, probably me, suggested we make it a musical, and I wrote one of my best songs for it. 
a song called The Same Sun Shines on Everyone. Well, I thought I had a voice. I held success in my hand. All the things money could bring, but it fell through my fingers like sand. I'd walk through the park with my girl. Oh, I remember the sun, how it shone. Oh, such a perfect world. But now, it's gone. It's the same, it's the same sun, sun that shines on everyone. everyone. Everybody in the world wants, to be, wants to be happy and free. It's the same sun that shines on you and me. We had lots of original ideas back then. They must have been good because others had success with them. I'm not saying they copied us. I'm just saying it could have been us. Our biggest disappointment was our least original idea. We were asked to record a charity song. It was after a massive earthquake in Mexico. There was a plan to rebuild Mexico City quickly with a new kind of brick. We were working for an organisation put together by Robert Maxwell. Yes, THE Robert Maxwell. Spiros went to pick up some sample bricks from the airport, but the authorities had smashed them up, looking for drugs. We put everything into the song. We wrote a catchy song and spent hours getting it finished in time for some bigwig to fly to America with it. We even got some kids in off the street in West Hampstead to sing it. But it all turned out to be a con. What a surprise with Robert Maxwell involved. I was working as a van courier so I would always be available, if ever required. Spiros bought me a van and let me live rent free in a house he was waiting to renovate but we kept being close without ever getting the cigar. I got married. I gave my guitars, keyboard, drum machine and sequencer to Spiros to pay for the van and decided to grow up. Spiros went on to fool the world with the Roswell alien autopsy hoax. In the Ant and Deck film he is played by Omid Jalili. Big thank you to Twangling Jack Ford for this week's album. Big thank you to Twangling Jack Ford for this week's entry into the Rye Light Zone. You're listening to the Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dan Cobain, and this is new music from Burt Honor. All I kill, I kill for you.
that was All I Kill, I Kill For You. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. And it's time for us to be joined by this week's guest now, who is science fiction author, Isaac Savage. Um, okay, so the first question is one that I ask everybody, which is, what was the last book that you read and what did you think of it? Yeah, well, the <clears throat> the last book I read was really based on uh, a movie that I saw that also inspired my book, and it's The Martian by mm-hmm. Andy Weir. And um, you know, the one that uh, stars Matt Damon. And uh, yeah, I I liked the movie, and then I thought, well, I'm going to read the book because it's all part of the writing and publishing process. And um, I have to say that the as I'm reading, it was uh, it was influenced by what I saw in the movie. So it was the, the wrong 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 way round, probably. But um, what it does tell you is that, you know, a picture paints a thousand words. But if you can write a thousand words, then uh, you're on your way to uh, doing a a fairly good job at writing. So so that's what I got out of that, I guess. Awesome. Uh, So I've read that as well. And I was lucky. So I read the book before seeing the movie. Um, And then I reread the book, actually. And then when when I reread it, I definitely saw kind of Matt Damon as... um, Mark Watney, but uh, well, what's also interesting as well is Andy Weir. He was uh, self-published to begin with, and he, his he just hit the zeitgeist just right or whatever, and so he sold a bunch of copies, and then that was when he got offered kind of a, a major publishing deal and and everything that came with it. Yeah, yeah, lucky him. Mm, Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, that's it, and and that leads quite nicely into um, chatting about yourself and about your book. So I wondered, could you tell us, you know, who is Isaac Savage, and uh, what can you tell us about his books? Yeah, um, well, Isaac Savage, a.k.a. me, uh, is now a writer of what I call speculative science fiction. And uh, the evolution of all of that really came about from my previous careers as uh, flying in spy planes, which not an awful lot of people know about up until this point, Um, buying and selling high-tech aircraft all containing cut, high tech, cutting edge technologies. And then being an executive in um, a high tech startup company in the space industry. And that was dealing with all of the big players in the space industry from NASA, ESA, Boeing, Airbus, uh, Utah Sat, and, and a whole, whole range of others. So the, the imagination of some of these designers is amazing. And uh, their projection of what's going to happen in the future sort of caught my interest mm. and uh, my imagination. And um, so that's that's where I am today, based on a long, long career in uh, in in technology and uh, and latterly in space uh, space technologies. Awesome. And so I guess you're you're kind of quite inspired by seeing what's happening in space, because it seems at the moment like a lot's going on. I was just before we hopped on this call, I was looking at um, uh, let me see if I can see what the company was called. It was a Japanese company. Uh, I think they were the first private company to attempt to land on the moon. Uh, Ice space, the Hakuto R mission. Um, and they had a live stream of, of this attempt. And unfortunately, it looks like because it only happened today, we're not entirely sure what happened, but they lost contact with the with the module just before it landed. Um but it's kind of fascinating. I mean, there was the there was a solar eclipse recently as well. Um, I mean, we had uh, the SpaceX rocket launch recently too. So I guess all seeing all that stuff in the news does that help to, to sort of uh, inspire you as well? Yeah, I, I follow that all as much as possible. And um, what doesn't get uh, publicised very much is what the Chinese are doing. And mm-hmm. um, you, you may or may not know that the Chinese have the only sovereign space station or they will have the only sovereign space station uh in low earth orbit which is uh is is quite something and the race is really on between the chinese and the americans about uh who's going to dominate the next Mm. phase of space exploration and uh they say that whoever does that will set the rules for how space is then i suppose regulated as we go forward Yeah, awesome, cool. And so you've worked with some coaches along the way. Can you tell us about some of the coaches you've worked with and how they've helped you? Yeah, you know one of them very well. Um, and uh, the other one is uh, Jana Brown, who um, 
has been very influential in getting me into this career. Um, and she, she as, as you know, writes in the genres of paranormal fantasy and science fiction, and the science fiction part helped an awful lot. Um, and the other one is yourself, Dane. Thank you very much for holding my hand and guiding me through what has been treacle for me in the sort of the marketing and the advertising and the social promotion of, of books. And um, and it I needed that because it was a new field for me. And uh, so, you know, I will always be grateful to both you and Jenna for for taking me this far and and hopefully you'll be there in the future to to make sure I stay in a fairly fairly good lane to uh, to get to some sort of success yeah well it's, it's like a rocket uh, like again a rocket launch isn't it so you've gone through the launch steps now but we need to still be there to help to guide you to uh, your destination on whatever far flung far flung planet you're aiming for you know yeah, and uh, to be a little bit unkind, you know, I don't want to be the launch and then the explosion in the uh, upper yeah. atmosphere. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, make sure I get uh, get on my way. So, yeah, grateful for that. Thank you. Oh, no problem. And and I think you touched on something that a lot of people don't realize that, you know, writing a book and publishing a book, that takes a lot of hard work and dedication. Um, but I think a lot of people think that that's it. Once you've written the book, you know, job done. Um and as you say, there's then the promotion of it, making sure it gets into people's hands as well. Um, and how are you finding balancing the time of, you know, working on marketing, working on promotion and making sure that the rest of the series comes out as well? Yeah, I I found it incredibly hard work. Um, I've, as you know, I've launched my first book. I've started the outline and um, looking at the the content of the second book and also need to look at uh, where the series is going because you need mm -hmm. to put feeders in the first book or so to make sure that the latter books make sense well that's the way i look at it as well yeah. but the the division of time at the moment it's been i've been immersed in trying to look at the marketing the advertising and other ways to promote the book um that's been quite hard work but I think like you've demonstrated to us, once you, whether you master it or not is another matter, but once you get on top of it, then you you start to understand what can happen, what could be possible. And um, so, so it's worth putting the time and effort in to get to the point where all of the hard work of creating the book in the first place is then pulled through because you understand what you need to do to it as far as the business is concerned. Yeah. Cool. And um, speaking, I suppose, of the, the business side of, side of writing, so I know you went to uh, London Book Fair, I think it was uh, last week, wasn't it? Uh, how was it? Yeah, uh, three days at Olympia. Massive, massive site, as you know. Um, yeah, I found it very fascinating. Um, I've been to conferences before for the aerospace and space industries. And to be fair to the, the publicising industry, um it it was no less um exciting and fascinating than any others lots of big players like uh, penguin if i should uh, mention them at all <laughs> and um and lots of uh exhibitors just i think there was something like 1500 exhibitors and yeah. um lots of countries represented and someone said 50 or 60 countries were there as well um so it's it's a big business and um you know lots of opportunities for a net networking the normal sort of thing and uh people there ready to help you in everything from cradle to grave as far as getting books in people's uh hands are concerned one of one of the most uh rewarding parts of the the fair for me was when I listened into an interview with Kate Moss. Kate Moss is one of my favorite authors um, in the historical and historical romance sort of genre. And uh, she was being interviewed by Louise Minchin from BBC, you remember? Mm -hmm. And Louise Minchin has always been um, a personality of great inspiration for me. So <clears throat> I got two two treats for mm -hmm. me. Two for the dosage, price of one. <laughs> for, for the price of one. So, yeah, I think it was... Uh, very very successful and the good part was that uh, there was a 
a large portion dedicated to uh, independent publishers and writers, uh, not as big as, as the rest of the um, traditional book selling organizations, but uh, it looked quite big to me. And uh, KDP was there uh, representing Amazon. And it was, uh, yeah, very nice to have that little home in the corner. Mm. Yeah, awesome, cool. And um, we've we've chatted a little bit about. Um, I know you're an Isaac Asimov fan, uh, but what what are some of the sci-fi books and movies and, and authors etc. that inspire you? Well, it, <clears throat> interestingly, um, the the two principal books that started me on this particular type of book that I've written was 1984 by George Orwell, and the Walking Dead by Robert Kirkman. And uh, I've, I've seen the, the movies and the TV series as well. And the reason for that is that um, my, my story has a, an unseen, sinister, omnipotent organization and foe for the group that I've created. And it's in, set in a dystopian, post-apocalyptic era of earth in around mm -hmm. 2038 and because of this catastrophic event there are equivalent to the walking dead or zombies but you know it's it's not based on the walking dead so those are two books that i've had to um really think about to to form my story but um of course as far as the science is concerned uh a movie which you may have seen called Oblivion with Tom Cruise, mostly because of the the sort of flying vehicles that I, I use in my book. Um, and also Ad Astra with Brad Pitt mm -hmm. and The Martian by um, you know Andy Weir. All of that combined puts um my story in this uh dystopian setting i suppose with overlords who are suppressing the the survivors on earth and it's a survival sort of thriller mm. in a science fiction setting and reaches out to the colonization of the moon and and mars so those are, are some and you know you could you could even say you know the the big epic star wars star mm. trek things like that all into play into your subconscious when you're putting the stuff together. Yeah, for sure. Cool. You're listening to the Arch on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. I'm here in conversation with science fiction author Isaac Savage, and this is Humans Can't Reboot with Don't Cry Out. No, no, no. 
That was Don't Cry Out by Humans Can't Reboot. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. And it's time for me to be rejoined now by this week's guest, who is science fiction author Isaac Savage. And I wanted to ask you, like, what's the difference between hard and soft sci-fi? And where, where do you think your book falls on the scales? Yeah, yeah. This is... Uh, I've, I've thought about um, where I fit uh, for some time because hard science fiction, as the name implies really attempts to look at the realism and hard science in in any particular type of expose whereas soft sci-fi looks at the sort of psychology sociology and anthropology blah and all the other ologies um (laughs) that happens in in a story and they look at the uh, societal sort of implications now what that left me with was a a between a really a rock and a hard place to coin a phrase um and and what what that means is i i've i've wanted to incorporate both soft and hard science fiction and someone came up with a brilliant sort of genre of speculative science fiction where mm-hmm. you can blend the two together and have the best of both worlds and therefore hopefully capture the readers from both hard and soft science fiction if that makes any sense yeah well it does and i suppose as well it, it more reflects reality like even if you look at the debates going around ai today you know there's a lot of discussion about the technology itself and what the technology is capable of but equally it's how we use that technology and what you know what our society with lots of ai would look like and i suppose it's a similar thing um and again you can you can kind of cover both of those um and you you mentioned that uh, your books are like cautionary tales, I suppose. What are, what are some of the the cautions? Um, I, I I guess I can kind of imagine a few of them, but based on what you've told me of it being that sort of post apocalyptic uh, sort of thing with with the overseers and all of that. But but what have you set yeah. out to to warn us about? Um, well, I I've set out to warn people, and I've based my warning on the conspiracy theories surrounding the World Economic Forum. Um, which mm-hmm. you may be aware about, and that's that's full of very, very wealthy and very, very powerful people, who the conspiracy theorists believe want to dominate the world um, through a single organization, uh, almost totalitarian. Which is where George Orwell comes into mm-hmm. my thinking. Um, so, elitist overlords is sort of like warning number one. Number two is unregulated, greedy industrialists. And this is where, again, wealthy and powerful um, technologists, industrialists, I, I'm going to I'm gonna say people like Elon Musk, although I think he's more of a philanthropist than anything, but, but people that have that sort of power who will develop technology which could put humanity at risk because they want the profits that could accrue mm. from from doing what they want to do. Um, then there's the rise of artificial intelligence that you've already mentioned and robotics and then, you know, think Terminator. Uh, and, and here's where Elon Musk came in with a good side saying, we've got to stop AI development because mm. it's going to come to a bad end if we don't be careful about it. And this, the social side is... Uh, the ever rising, um, I suppose, spectre of fascism and racism, um, where societies are divided, excluded, and that could create big tensions, which can bring its own problems, as you know. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Um, and, you know, you touched on uh, sort of a conspiracy theory there. I don't know whether you would consider this next one a, a conspiracy theory or not. I suspect it depends where you fall on the argument. Uh, aliens, do you think they exist or not, and why or why not? Uh, well, because I I put myself in the speculative uh, spectrum of science fiction, I've got to answer it on both sides, hard and soft science fiction. So the hard science fiction would say, do aliens exist? No. But that is the aliens as far as the likes of E.T. is concerned, mm-hmm. um, from from what we know so far. But in the next so many years, I think exploration on Mars will detect 
probably microbes that are set in the subsoil of Martian terrain. And it's the microbes that they bring back and study to, to find out what life could have been like on Mars in that respect. So it's it's I think that's the hard science fiction answer. The soft science fiction answer is yes, of course there are aliens. Um, how dare we assume <laughs> that we are the only beings in this wide universe that have any sort of sentience about us and that there's nothing else that exists. Yeah. So it's out there. They may be detecting us. We don't have the technology to detect them. So that's a, that's a bit of a bit of a mouthful of an answer, but hopefully yeah. it gives you something to think about. No, it's a good one. I mean, because I, I kind of look at it from like the statistical and probability point of view. And the argument there is like basically it's inevitable that there is life elsewhere. Again, whether it's whether it's uh intelligent life, whether it's like ET or not, that's a different question. Um, but then they, they going back to Elon Musk, it's that there's that idea, I'm sure you've come across um the likelihood that we that we're all living in a computer simulation. And the mathematics behind that argument makes sense. Um that it makes it pretty much inevitable that we are living in a simulation because there are all these possible simulation worlds and then ours. So uh, statistically, it's unlikely that we live in reality or whatever. Um, but I suppose that's kind of the job of, of speculative writers like yourself to, I guess, not necessarily answer these questions, but certainly to kind of raise them. Yeah, raise the discussion because I, I agree. I mean, I, um my my son is uh, heavily into this sort of speculation and uh, he's written many small articles about about that and uh, he thinks i don't exist <laughs> <laughs> nice nice awesome um okay so and what i wanted to know as well and is like when you look at science fiction especially like going back to maybe things like jules verne and you know uh, frankenstein's often cited as like the first sci-fi book um but a lot of the time, real world developments have been inspired by science fiction. Why do you think that happens? Um, I, I guess you know, ever since the the dawn of time, you know, one million years BC, and all that, um, people have, you know, dreams are cheap. Um, visions, conceptualization of things is easy to talk about, to think about, to draw about. Um, but the extrapolation of that into, I suppose, experimentation, into prototyping, uh, development, and then final production is the harder part. But the people that do that, the more sort of uh, scientific technology type people, need the dreamers to say, well, that is a brilliant idea. I'm sure I could make that. So I, I think that's happened an awful lot. And of course, an awful lot of what's happened um, at, in NASA, uh, those technologies have been drawn into the real world. So it goes around and around. And then, you know, those those new technologies inspire new dreams and, um, and the cycle continues. Yeah, like a feedback loop. Yeah, oh. yeah. Awesome. Um, I just want to ask a couple more questions. I'm keeping an eye on the time as well. Um, how do you make sure that the science in your science fiction is accurate? I suppose, particularly when you're getting towards the, the harder element of that sort of hard and soft mix. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I've got a wealth of experience and, and knowledge from what I've done in, in my previous careers, but, um, I try my best to keep up with what's happening. And, and you've mentioned these news reports and if there's anything of, of uh, a new nature in, in some of the news reports i'll dig deep and do my own research whether it's through um google or finding academic papers or scientific papers i'll try to keep keep things as real as possible and i've still got a network of much more clever people than than i'll ever be uh that i can call upon and say uh do you think this would really work? Yeah, I don't always, I don't always <laughs> listen to them, but uh, you know. <laughs> but at least you can ask, yeah. At least I cool. can ask. And what can people expect from book one in your series, as well as uh, the books that you've got to come? Um, right in book book one, it's dystopian, it's post apocalyptic, it's survival. Um, there's a there's a main character called Asia 
who's asked by a neighbor um, to help rescue the, the father, her father, who's also Aisha's old colleague from NASA, who is on the uh, space station. And apparently that's been overtaken by the, the sinister um, overlord organization is running out of oxygen. And it's all about trying to get to the space station in this uh, apocalyptic environment where there's things like, you know, um, the walking dead, robotic militia, scavengers, bounty hunters, and all sorts of uh, different threats. And um, Aisha is a, an ex NASA astronaut. So she finds something and, and off they go. Shouldn't give too much away. <laughs> but, um, you know, every chapter is full of real action, adventure, excitement, and um, and suspense. Um, for the, the follow-on um, books, it's really about uh, <clears throat> what's happening on Mars with the colonization there and, and the moon in particular, which is where I've drawn upon the Martian and mm -hmm. Ad Astra, and uh, how their societies are starting to... Um, develop into uh, an ap apocalyptic situation just as happened on Earth and how that can be um, solved, resolved, stopped, or whether it just explodes into dis dis disaster. So there's action throughout the solar system in the follow-on books, but one important thread is one of the characters has latent special skills not superpowers like superman but latent special skills which develop very strongly and that develops a new thread of tension and suspense as we go forward cool great and um you've kind of covered what's next for you i suppose um you know you're going to be working on marketing working on the rest of the series but is there anything else that you plan to work on uh, over the next 12 months or so and the other part is where can people follow you to find out more and get a copy of the book um, yeah, it's it's really as you suggest. I'm I'm working on book two, but also at the same time, feeding ideas for the follow-on books into book two to make it um, as seamless as possible, um, and the marketing that goes with all of that. And at the moment, probably to keep up to date with the developments of all of that, um, you can go to my social media feeds on Instagram, Isaac Savage writer and facebook isaac savage writer again um so uh you should be able to just plug those in and, and come up with uh, what i'm doing so uh be be good to uh hook up with people <laughs> Oh
That was Live Our Dreams by Umar Ara. You're listening to the Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and it's time for us to head over to the Oak Shed now for this week's album review, courtesy of Twangling Jack Ford. Big Star, number one record. I had heard all about Big Star long before I heard anything by them. They were underground legends fronted by Alex Chilton, singer with the box tops who had a massive hit with The Letter. I loved jangly power pop. I even played in a band that did jangly power pop. I would have studied Big Star. I would have copied their riffs and solos. I would have been inspired by their sunny lyrics and sweet harmonies. I would have loved Big Star, but they were not part of my life. They were not on the radio. No one I knew had their records. And by the time I needed them most, they had split. So when many years later I took the CD with their first two albums out from the local library, I thought I would be blown away, but I wasn't. I would have been blown away if I'd heard them in 1975. They would have been perfect on the pub rock scene. They could have been held in the same kind of esteem as the Flaming Groovies. But Shake Some Action became a blueprint for punk and power pop, and Big Star remained little more than a rumour. By the time I encountered Big Star, I had already known and loved Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers and R.E.M. Even so, these Big Star songs are good songs, well played with harmony vocals and melodic guitar solos. They have a West Coast early 70s sound even though they recorded in Memphis. They are how the birds should have ended up. Other acts have covered their songs and they are better known now than they ever were back in their day. Big Star, number one record. Big thank you to Twangling Jack Ford for this week's album review and for this week's entry to the Rylight Zone. Thank you to Isaac Savage for being this week's guest. Thank you to everyone whose music I've shared. As always, you can find us on Facebook if you search for The Art Show on Wickham Sound. You should be able to find us. We are repeated on Wickham Sound on Monday nights. We're on the Wickham Sound Listen Again. We're on iTunes, Spotify and wherever else you get your podcasts. Please do leave us a review on your podcast platform of choice. It all helps. And you can reach out to me here at the studio on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at Wickham Sound. Sound.org.uk. So, thanks a lot for listening. As always, I'm going to leave you with one last tune, and this is Andrew Coburn with A Part We Fell. I'll catch you next week. The waves they came on the seventh day, the waves they washed it all away now. I saw you there, just standing bare.